we pray and then we'll Kevin's, get started. Kevin's good. His sound is not on, I don't think. Yeah, I, I'm muted. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not muted. Oh, Showed it on the TV. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the privilege of coming around your word and um, looking at what is a what can feel very familiar psalms and stories but um we we need to let them get one one level deeper into our hearts i pray that we do that today in jesus name amen all right kevin which psalm did i pick uh oh man i totally forgot that i was gonna try to guess uh, <laughs> let's see 14 hmm Sorry, 23. 23. 20, <laughs> yes, we're going to look at 23. Is this okay, so because everything has been so dark <laughs> for four weeks that um, I wanted to, I, I, I wanted a bridge here. And so um, we're going to look at Psalm 23 and get, and get a, a look at another aspect of David's heart. Um, and it does relate to the story I think we're going to look at today, although you're going to have to, uh, you folks can, can point me in a different direction, but um, it, it relates uh, to, to what is, uh, what is uh, going on with David reputationally in uh, chapter 25, uh, first Samuel 25. So could I have a volunteer to read Psalm 23 or recite it? If if you can, and preferably in the King James, because that's how it sounds right to me. Well, it's not in the King James. I'll do it. All right, Gordon. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of death, you see, I'm getting them both mixed up here. <laughs> uh, the valley of the shadows of death. I, I fear, I will fear no evil. For you, for, for you and me, you, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of mine enemies and anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me the rest of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's work backwards. In the in verses five and six, what did you hear? That God will take care of you. Hmm. There's a thought of abundance. My cup overflows. Mm. Presence of his enemies is mentioned. We don't get far away from them, do we? What's uh, going on in the presence of his enemies? A banquet with God. Mm. What do you envision there? Well, Thanksgiving din dinner to beat all Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> no matter what happens to him, he'll be with God. Mm. Well, and your enemies will be all sitting around on the edge, on the perimeter, watching you at your banquet. Right? Like raptor's dogs? You're in the presence of the enemies. You're not, they're not like some distant thing. They're right there. Yeah. How do you envision them? Are they, are they threatening? Are they jealous? Are they, is there, is there menace or defeat? What do you, what do you envision there? More envy than jealous. I think, uh, I think envy is a, a more, Vicious word, word, you know. Mm -hmm. 
I'm a Trekkie, so I envision a level five force field, which God has put up, and so they cannot come near the table where I am having my meal. Are they serving Romulan ale? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's another thing besides this banquet. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I understand that a uh, shepherd used to discipline his sheep with those. Mm. So, so uh, David is saying he looks, he, he is comforted by the fact that God will keep him in line. If, if you are straying away from the pen or straying away from the herd, how's the shepherd going to get a hold of you? With the crook of the neck of the staff. Yeah. You like that? It's hard on the sheep. <laughs> it is what's harder on the sheep going over the edge of a cliff going over the edge of the cliff yes getting eaten by wolves wolf. right kevin oh getting preyed on by a lion or a wolf yeah yeah you and dan were on the same trek also think about what comes after that you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies if if the sheep senses danger, they're going to run the other way, no matter what the shepherd tells them to do. There could be a sequence here. I'm not, uh, it, it may be sequential. It may be, may be abstract, but a sequence where um, the, the sheep has actually tried to run away from the enemies, but go in their own way of running away from the enemies. It's similar to a Tower, tower of Babel situation where um, we're afraid of being scattered, so we're going to build a city here in order to make a name for ourselves so that we don't get scattered. When, when, because it's a big, bad world out there, and, and we wanna, uh, we're want going to look out for our own protection, when in fact what God wanted was for them to be scattered and to go out into the big, bad world. The sheep, if the, if the sheep senses danger, sheep's going to go, the sheep are going to scatter. They're going to run in a million different directions away from where they think the danger is. The, 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 um, what they can't see is that the Lord has set a table for them. No, no, no. You're going to, I know the enemies are around, but I got you. And so I want you to come this way. Um, and, and so there might be a sequence where the rod and the staff have, quote, comforted me by... whether it's toward the enemy or away from the enemy, sending me in the way that the Lord wants me to go because he, he has the sovereign knowledge that is, that he's, he's got this and he wants me to let him got this. Uh, it would be sort of like uh, Nehemiah when Nehemiah refused to run away despite the false rumors that were coming. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and Sanballat and Tobias sending letters to the king and and the the uh, the princes of the area threatening absolutely. I guess I never thought these last couple of verses still had the imagery of sheep, because sheep don't sit at a table, mm. and he's already led them beside green pastures where they're going to eat, and yeah. quiet waters where they're going to drink. So I always just thought it was kind of like a change of scene. Yeah. It could be, like I said, it could be abstract, but there could be a, there could be a sequence there. You know, you don't, it's impossible to completely get into the author's mind and yet, and yet context can, context might bind. So move backward, go and go into, um, into the middle section. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What do you hear? Going into battle. Hmm. Just that in danger, God's with us. And that that's the thing to hold on to, that he's with us. I seem to remember that in uh, the Pilgrim's Progress, the Pilgrims spent a certain amount of time in the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And some of his comrades 
actually want to be with the Lord there. Hmm. Going back to the, the pastor question, Frank, um, when, when you are, when you're called upon to be a minister, a teacher, a preacher, whatever, you look around, you see some other sheep being wildly more successful than you are. You also see some of them getting picked off and, um, and so, you know, Frank, I guess we don't think about what is, we think of being alone in the valley of the shadow of death, but if we're a part of a flock, then it's very possible that the entire flock doesn't make it through. During the Second World War, this hymn, 23rd Psalm, was thought to encourage the troops and it was sung almost at every service that I went to as a young mm. man. Did it encourage the troops? It certainly did. Mm. We used to have to memorize it, which wasn't difficult because we sang it every Sunday. <laughs> but if you couldn't repeat it in class, you were like you would in a regular class in school, you were asked to stand in the corner. <laughs> I uh, you, you went to the Christian schools I did, Gordon. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think my I think my Christian schools were in the Scottish tradition. So, what's the valley of the shadow of death? Where is that? I've always thought that was more of a state of mind than an actual physical location, mm -hmm. more like despair or depression. Mm -hmm. Well, Certainly that was be. the Second World War to me. Mm. I think it's a place where death is near. So um, could be, you know, you're ill and dying or could be a dangerous situation. But I guess the one thing I think of is 100% we're all going to face death, right? There's no escape from death in this world until Jesus comes again. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with Jeannie. Uh, I would say that uh, the valley of the shadow of death is when you're faced with either someone you love or you yourself are moving very close to a very real possibility of dying. And as far as depression, I think I know because I've been there that clinical depression is an awful, awful thing. But uh, if God protects you from being suicidal, it's not the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah, but it can also sure feel like it. You know, the uh, <clears throat> I, I've noticed that, that most of you have gone gone internally with this and and um, I think I think that the the I will fear no evil. David doesn't say that that I'm gonna that I won't fear death. Um, he's not saying that I uh, I nothing even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no bad thing i will fear no death i will he says i will fear no evil um i'm not sure if it's reading too much into it but um david david might not be fearing death as much as he might be um or he he might not be speaking of a fear of death so much as a fear of 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 evil of darkness of being cut off from god of being cut off from the shepherd of um you know and 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 maybe not the the rod and the staff yes they comfort me as a as a you know 
pulling me along through that valley. Um, but I also see that the Lord's, that, that the shepherd is going to wield that staff to protect me if he needs to. Um, and, and so, yes, as a corrective measure, but also as a protective measure. When we, I use the metaphor, when we put the cross around our necks, okay? When we, when we call on the name of the Lord Jesus, we are, we are not only accepting his salvation, but we're also placing ourselves under his protection. Um, and I don't, if you haven't, if you haven't seen this, if you haven't been a part of situations where there, you could, you could see that there were actual spiritual forces at war. Um, it's an extraordinary and startling thing and also very humbling to realize that the Lord will fight for his glory. The, the Lord will push evil back. And, um, and as, a, as a very real and, and comforting thing, um, the Lord will use his staff in order to protect his own um, in order to expand his kingdom. And, um, and so while I don't want to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, whatever that, whatever that looks like, my eye should not be on the walls or the darkness closing in around me. My eye should be on that staff. My eye should be on that cross that you, you, you know, that you keep your eye on the ball kind of mentality, keep your eye on the staff and, um, and let that, if you don't see that staff in action, you don't have anything to be afraid of because the shepherd's going to see it before you do. And he's going to act on it before you can and with greater power than you could ever muster. Um, boy, it's tough to be a sheep. <clears throat> so Jehovah is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What do you hear? What do you hear about David here? Translates his experience of being a shepherd um, to his relationship with the Lord. The same, the same uh, uh, protection, as you said, the same protection um, and guidance that that he gave to his sheep, he recognizes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a sheep. And... Hmm. I think the thing I always notice is that God is the actor, right? God's the subject of the verbs. God makes me lie down. God leads, God restores, God guides, that he's the one acting. And so as the sheep, we are we are kind of passive. He's doing these things for us. Mm. Mm, that's a good observation. There is a there there is a a um, a third a third person voice, not a first person voice, where David is experiencing the Lord. He's not he's not the shepherd at that point. And I think the other thing that strikes me is the second part of verse three, it's for his name's sake. Like, I like to think it's so that I'll look good <laughs> because I'm on the path of righteousness, but that is not the point. It is for his namesake. We're going to call her righteous genie and we are <laughs> all going to marvel at her. <laughs> um, under me, the David um, is content with with where he's at. Where do you see that? Well, makes me lie down in green pastures. 
leads me beside still waters. You know, I envision you know, walking up over to a nice, uh, you know, calm field, you know, there's a stream room nearby. And I'm just like not having a picnic or just, uh, you know, relaxing. Um, you know, so obviously, you know, it, it shows that he, that, that he feels content you know, that the Lord's with him. Mm. So I think I've read in Philip Keller's book about the psalm that sheep are so stupid, myself included, that <laughs> we would keep eating in one area until all the grass is gone and we would be down to the dirt and we would not move to a new area unless the shepherd leads me to a green pasture. Yep. Jeannie, is that a, is that a, um, a shepherd reads Psalm 23 or, or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's Philip Keller. I bet it's it's an old book. I read it when I was a college student a while ago. That's that's the guy. Who's <laughs> a, right? Is, is that the guy? Kevin? Is that the guy who is a shepherd? Maybe, maybe, maybe he ha he has some actual experience as a shepherd. It's okay. kind of like a shepherd looks at Psalm twenty three or something like that. Sure. I, it is a very old book. But like Jeannie said, a very easy read and a very good book. And it, he is a shepherd, or he was a shepherd, amongst other things. So I want to I want to grab onto what Jeannie said earlier: the idea that that it's for the Lord's name's sake, and and then connect that with this idea of calm. when other shepherds would go to would would you know, walk up to the lord in the field there is a a sense that the lord if we can imagine him bragging on the sheep that that the lord wants the world to notice what it is like to be a part of his flock And there's then a pressure on us that if our, if our um, chief end is to bring glory to God, in what way do we make the Lord look impressive as a shepherd? Well, you know, my uh, uh, sister-in-law, Judy, uh, has trouble sleeping sometimes and she will imagine uh herself coming out of a stone uh sheepfold at a great rate of speed and then uh jesus is calling to her and, and she hears his voice and she responds and, and that's a good way for her to get to sleep sounds like a great way to get to sleep i generally don't stop running in my I can't go back to sleep. What else does anybody notice in the entire psalm? I had just a comment on verses five and six. We we were talking about whether, um, you know, is is, Dave, is there still shepherd imagery, or is he kind of transitioned to 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 a, a less. Um, just more ab more abstract terminology and mm -hmm. um a couple commenters have have uh wondered whether uh goodness and mercy fall like pursuing after after the the psalmist are are uh, alluding to sheepdogs as if they're two sheepdogs <laughs> named goodness and kindness so um that's just a little detail but uh The, the the poem can be uh, elusive in subtle ways and and certainly as as a as a poem it it um, it it, uh, it engages in metaphor and the likening of one thing to another so there's it kind of 
it, it might permeate the entire psalm rather than seeming like it has a, a sharp break between the initial imagery and, and David's later points in the, the last two verses. It's also a psalm that will capture you differently at different times in your life, in different seasons of your life. Um, you, <clears throat> and there's a lot of scriptures that do this, but I think Psalm 23 has this staying power where you can, you can read it to a congregation of 300 and 300 people will hear, will experience 300 different things. Um, and where, like, you know, we've been reading it our whole lives. Gordon, you've, uh, your whole life, you've been reading it for what, 50 years now? And, uh, oh, about 60. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you read it for the thousandth time. You're like, I never noticed that. That's correct. It, All I think of when I read it or heard it, heard it read is it's a meaning of hope for me. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. It fills us each time. Doesn't it? All right. Could somebody read Psalm 23 or no, who, um, who was the, who was the reader? I'm, I'm sorry. I read memory. it. I read it. I read it. All right, it. Gordon, could you read this again, please? <clears throat> Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies and anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I see sheepdogs now, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you for that image. Oh, by the way, I have a, a, a story about lions. All right, turn back to 1 Samuel 25. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, when uh, the lions want to catch an antelope, they spy a bunch of antelopes. And one lion goes out and circles around the antelope so that he's at the opposite point from where most of the lions are. And then he lets forth a ferocious roar and the antelopes panic and they run straight into the pride of lions. And, and that's why we need God's rod and his staff in difficult times. I, I, I think that is a, that is a, uh, a powerful image. What, you know, a, a more succinct way of what I was trying to get at when I talked about uh, keeping your eye on the shepherd's staff, that if the shepherd doesn't panic, I don't need to panic. If the shepherd doesn't, if, if the shepherd keeps moving forward, regardless of whether I think that's a good idea, I need to stick close to that staff. Don't take my eye off of it. Um, even if it goes into the valley of the shadow of death. All right. Uh, in 1 Samuel 25 through 28, there are four distinct uh, stories. There is the story of David and Nabal and Abigail. There is the story of um, uh, where David spares Saul for the last time. Uh, there is... Uh, David's response to that, where David um, runs away to the Philistines and actually offers himself to their military service. And there is, um, and then there is my favorite story, Sa uh, Saul with the witch of Endor, where he met the Ewoks. <laughs> 
Somebody, somebody knows their Star Wars. Very good. All right. And so I want to put out there that there are, um, that there are, these are four distinct images, three of them about David, one of them about Saul. And I'm curious if anybody has a really strong desire that says, you know what, I'd love to dive deeply into this one. I read the, the four chapters and I thought that 25 read like a modern romance novel. <laughs> and I think that Abigail had this all planned from the very beginning. <laughs> and when she says, for example, then Abigail made haste and took two, 200 loaves and, and all the rest of the stuff that she took with her. This was really, really, really going after David. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it. I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I'd thought of it more innocently, but but boy, Gordon, you're on to something. You might even go as far, if you were rewriting it for a movie, you might even go as far as saying that she, she set up the death of her husband. Yeah, well, you see in 37, it says, in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. So maybe she helped him along a little by spiking it. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> Make a movie out of this one chapter. You know, uh, when I lived in Maryland, I was fr friends with this one couple, and we were discussing the story of David and Nabal and Abigail, and she was very much of the opinion that Abigail was out to get David. <laughs> so... So the, the working theory here is that Abigail saw David as a parachute and um, that somehow um, he can get me out of, out of Nabal's house, but we've got to do it the right way. Which meant first kill her husband. <laughs> well, yeah, I... I don't think it insinuates she killed her husband, but um, there's there's no way. It sounds like Nabal had a stroke. There, there's no, uh, ha, ha. I, <laughs> a little digitalis might have helped that along. <laughs> well, did you? Digitalis, uh, Dr. Bryant, is from Africa, and I don't think it came to the rest of the world until <laughs> Queen Victoria's time. You know a lot about your poisons there, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a different take. Um, Go ahead, Gary. If Abigail wanted to have Nabal killed, she could just um, she could sort of just let David do it. So uh, I, don't, I don't think that was her intent. Hmm. Yeah, she could have if she wanted out that badly. Um, David, David had his reasons. What do you think of David's reasons? Let's look back. Um, David sends peace be with you. You know, thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you. Peace to your house. Peace to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us and we did them no harm and they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. There is a, um, there's, there's a call for hospitality here on a feast day. Welcome us. And, and remember that we looked after you and protected you in the wilderness. Remember um, back, I think it was chapter 22, when uh, David was, was um, hiding out.
but had the people of the land coming to him and looking for protection, looking to be a part of his band. And so David has been uh, providing this, this tribal protection. Remember, there's also a, a, um, uh, a contrast being drawn that, that the Israelites have to look to David for protection because Saul is not providing it. Um, but David, David asks for hospitality from Nabal and they, they tell him to shove off and, um, in fact, Nabal says, who is this son of David? There are many servants who are abandoning their masters these days. That's cutting. He obviously knows what's going on. He's showing allegiance to Saul. So David says, okay, everybody strap on your, your swords. Here we go. <laughs> well, I think that that was kind of a, maybe, of course, I don't know, you know, I didn't live back then, but lessons were different. That seems like a pretty strong response. That, well, the guy didn't give me anything, so we'll just kill him. Hmm. Yeah, Gary. How, well, I, I think in that culture, it was really expected of people that, you know, if you had a traveler or somebody come by your place, That's that you time. extend some hospitality to them, you know, give them a meal, that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I think Nabal is, is sort of violating that tradition of the people and maybe... Uh, I don't know maybe David's taking it to an extreme, but uh, I think the uh, the initial slight is in his not offering the hospitality to someone who actually asked for it. You know, yeah. I understand that uh, Arabs, if uh, even their mortal enemy winds up outside their tent, they will feel honor bound to uh, offer him a meal. And likewise, if you look at Abraham at the Oak of Mamre, he didn't know initially who these three guys were, but he was very Johnny on the spot to get his orders sent to get these guys uh, some nice meat and so on. Yeah, that's true. Culturally, it was uh, hospitality was was. Um was a matter of honor and especially in a in a frontier land if we can think of it that way where um it was not dangerous to be outside of the village or outside of protection at night and um where food could be scarce the american frontier was no different roadside homes um were uh, became places of refuge for the traveler um, that that ethos only went away as our land got more and more settled um, the 1800s if you're traveling through the woods and you come upon a cabin and it's it's close to nightfall you ask if you can stay uh, it's, it's part of the, the cultural expectation here too and so there is a there is an honor that is lost um but but yeah david's response it strikes me that um nabal's words what is it uh there are many servants who are turning against their masters this this uh, story occurs right after David spares Saul's life. And right before he does it again. Yes. So certainly he, he spared Saul's life and, and, and I'm sure that the calculus of self-preservation enters his mind and he's, and probably, he probably, it probably occurred to him that not sparing Saul's life, killing him would, 
be to his personal benefit. It would it would prevent him from, you know, Saul coming after him again. So um, the restraint that he, you know, it, it the he he might have been very very conscious like of the restraint that he was taking for the sake of um, honoring Saul still being the Lord's anointed. And then, and then to have Nabal throw out this comment, like, well, you're, you know, you're turning against your master and David to know that's just not how it is. And you have no idea. No good deed goes unpunished, right? Mm -hmm. Like David could say, great, this is what I get. And in a Psalm, Lord, okay, this is what I get. Yeah, Nabal's, Nabal's words, Nabal didn't simply say no. He could have just said, no, I'm sorry, not today. Or I don't like you. Okay. But this insinuation that David is in rebellion against Saul, where David knows that Saul left him. David didn't lead a rebellion against Saul. Saul turned on him. And now he gets to carry the burden of the Lord's anointing for decades, waiting for the Lord to actually follow through on that. And in, in chapter 26, when he has another chance, and he's sending Abishai down <clears throat> in the camp. He says, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die or he will go down in the battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put my hand against the Lord's anointed. Like, yeah, he knows there's personal advantage to Saul dying, but he is not going to be the one to do it. Uh, well, you know, and there's another thing about Nabal's words is in that culture, words meant a whole lot. Like if you swore an oath, it was a big deal if you broke that oath, unlike our culture. And... Uh, Likewise, uh, consider uh, Jacob and Esau. They, they desperately wanted uh, their father to pronounce certain words over them. And that, they believed, had power. So when uh, Nabal, in essence, dissed David, it was more than just talking trash it, it it had a or at least that culture would give those words some some powerful significance so let let me go to abigail's speech uh, verse 23 when abigail saw david she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Which means, yeah, it means fool. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord, whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as Yahweh lives and as your soul lives, because, the, because Yahweh has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant. For Yahweh will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of Yahweh, and evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living of the care of Yahweh your God, and the lives of your enemies shall sling out, or, or he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when Yahweh has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, 
My Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs or conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord taking vengeance himself. And when Yahweh has dealed well, dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Can't you see Virginia Mail saying that with tongue in <laughs> Yes, but I also hear some Psalm 23 in this. When David turned her words that um, uh, because my Lord is fighting the battles of Yahweh, evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of Yahweh your God. Though I walk through the valley of shallow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and staff. They comfort me. And uh, the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand. That's, that's maybe, the, you know, the disciplinary crook of the shepherd too. Right. Um, actually, Abigail's words are maybe intentionally a little bit incorrect because... The, like in her speeches, the, the Lord is restraining David at that moment rather than the Lord has restrained you. Mm. He says it as if, you know, he's already been restrained. There, it, there's I, some, at least it, it seems from to me. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, possible it's possible that, that if David, David even stops to talk to her, that she feels she's already won. Maybe David smelled all those loaves of bread. <laughs> even, even a rash man, when he's forced to pause, has a habit of turning and changing direction. It is a sign of I don't know if it's valor, but it's definitely of of sensibility, <clears throat> of non irrationality, for David to to stop and listen to the woman of the house coming to talk to him. He could have brushed her aside and said, "My beef isn't with you. Get out of the way." But could he really? Because as soon as she gets to him, she throws herself on the ground flat. <laughs> and, and she starts talking about him as my lord. This is a big contrast from Nabal's uh, speech. I, I would think that uh, anybody would want to hear what she had to say. She's putting temptation in his way. <laughs> Gordon, you just, you got a thing for her. <laughs> Picture one of those Ar Amish Harlequin novels. <laughs> My goodness, you got to get out of the paperback section, Gordon. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, I laugh about it. It is, there's, there's all of those elements in this story. Now, a Abigail knows that Nabal is a fool, and in David's kingdom, there's not going to be much place for fools. Just because there is a, a personal reason to want to see David succeed and Nabal fail, does that make her um, a harlot? No, I was not going to, but yes, does that, does, does that make her wrong? Well, we, we don't know. We don't know what was in her mind. One thing though, she, she didn't want her entire household, including Nabal to be just trashed by a, a, a very dangerous military man. Yep. 
and and David could have. Remember that Nabal's um, shepherds were under David's protection, and and so David, yeah, she could have seen that that Nabal could have been wiped out. That's a good point. So she's going to do whatever it takes in order to in order to make this last until tomorrow. And we'll figure out tomorrow tomorrow, but I'm going to we're going to at least survive the day. Well, she really did throw him under the bus though, right? She oh, Nabal? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, she didn't say, "Oh, Nabal's really a good man. You should uh give him a break this time she said he's worthless he's a fool <laughs> you just don't know him like i do <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we think oh how why did she marry him she uh, culturally did she have a choice likely As i not. said it's a great chapter <laughs> <laughs> i have a it question is. yeah I have a question which doesn't really per just out of curiosity um after Nabal dies, she marries David. What happens to all of his property and everything? Who <laughs> took it over? Goes to David. Exactly. Oh, it goes to David. Oh, okay. Yep. I was wondering. Yep. Well, an another thing we should uh, point out in Abigail's uh, speech is that I don't think too many people in David's time understood that it was not appropriate to take vengeance. And uh, that's what Abigail is preaching that it's not appropriate for David to take vengeance. That's right. That's exactly right. And if if we want to put ourselves, all right, Gordon, let's yeah. let's go into 18th century England. Um, you accuse me of cheating at cards. You take that back, sir. I will not take yeah, it back. Duel. <laughs> yes, so we're going to have a duel. That's right. This is this is an honor thing for David, where and Abigail saying, "You you stupid men, you do not need to be locked into this honor thing." She throws herself at David's feet and said, "It doesn't have to be solved this way." I know. I know. Nabal's an idiot. Trust me. Trust me, David. I know. How am I? <laughs> but it doesn't have to be solved this way. I thought it was interesting that she didn't say he doesn't deserve to be killed. She, she said, please forgive him. <laughs> yes. Could you imagine, like, you know, it says that, that she waited until he was sober the next morning to tell him what she had done. Could you imagine what it'd be like for Nabal to hear you're now in David's debt. He forgave you. She's a conniving woman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so was Jacob, and God chose him to hold on to the promise. The, the Israel, the one who wrestled with God and lived. Oh, you know what? Uh... I read one commentator who said that uh, the incident was Abigail, which wound up with David getting uh, married to Abigail, gave David an excuse to kill Uriah the Hittite because he was thinking, well, it worked out before the guy died. I got his wife, I got his property and so he might have been trying to rationalize what he was planning for Uriah based on uh, Abigail. Yeah, it could have. I, I, I think David's capable of killing Uriah without any justification at all. And, and consider that at a different point in David's life where he is now the king, as opposed to what some consider a rebel. So I think it's good, Kevin, that you recognize this is nested between two incidents where Saul, David spares Saul's life. And, and David even asks in, Saul, in, in chapter 26, why are you chasing me? 
What have I, what have I done to you? And Saul says, you're right. I'm, I'm out of my mind. I'm out of my wits. And it's the last time he sees David it says, Saul goes back to his place. And Saul does not come after David again. David, though, shrewdly realizes in chapter 27 that, you know what? Um, if I stick around here, it's likely Saul is going to come back around to this. I want to kill David again. And that's when he flees to the Philistines. So there is there is knowledge that you have as a reader that the characters don't there is knowledge nabal does not know that you know he knows the saul version of the story he doesn't know the david side of the story and and he's a fool he likely doesn't care but he um but the people are choosing sides based on what they perceive with incomplete knowledge and and david is making decisions based on what he sees ba with incomplete knowledge but a growing sense you know if there's if there is one thing that comes out of this story about the lord is that the lord is in fact going to look out for david in a promise preserving way um that should if if nobody else hears anything in this story david should when the writer comes out when, when abigail comes out and and or whoever how it just says david heard that he was dead when david hears that he's dead he should say huh jehovah protected me didn't he yeah huh but in this case what Jehovah protected him from was being a bloodthirsty gang leader, a murderous gang leader. We are often the one that the Lord has to protect us from the most often. There are times when the Lord puts his hand over our mouths or sends us the wrong direction and keeps us from evil. That is the prayer. Isn't it? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I'm hearing echoes of some of our current political discussions here mm. and thinking there were, well, are you red or are you blue? And next month you might have to change. Next month you might have to change. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of, of good sci-fi stories where something cataclysmic happens and then the, the, the actors who had their hands on the button were ready to obliterate each other took a step back um, because they saw something bigger at play. Nabal wasn't going to see that something bigger. Saul was not going to see that something bigger. But David saw something bigger was at play. And this is why he's a man after God's own heart. So if nothing else, he at least accepted the possibility that the Lord was protecting him and, and allowed himself to be talked out of a very irrational, like you said, Frank, a, a gangster type of action. Um, all in the name of personal honor that would not have served his purpose. And God uses Abigail, perhaps for her own selfish reasons, to call that to his attention. So let's pray, and then I want to send you to church. Lord, thank you for... Um, thank you for stories, for history that becomes metaphor. Um, I pray that you would keep us from temptation and deliver us from evil as we think about each other, as we, um, as we confront our current politics, our current family conversations, 
um, recognize that there might be a still small voice who is calling on us to, um, to pause and recognize that your stronger hand might be at work, that your rod and your staff might be leading us in a direction that we just can't see and we need to trust you. I pray that we would trust you. Thank you for your faithfulness in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks everybody. And well, they post the uh, oh. greetings for next week. Oh, 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 yes. I'm sorry. The readings for next week are first Samuel 29 through second Samuel one. So you're going to see the end of Saul and, um, and David's lament. And then the Psalms are 17, 25, 28, 35, 40, 41, 140. Will they be published in the notice? Uh, I assume they will. Paul, Kevin, is that correct? They've been posted in the Belfield Weekly. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay. They're also posted online on the website. Um, if you go to the uh, Sunday School tab, you, there's there's the whole list for the whole semester there. Yeah, they are. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank okay. you. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you, Mary Lou.